Well, on this 7th of April, a couple of notes I think we should uh, discuss, and that is apparently the world is ending tomorrow. So glad that you chose today to spend time with us, and um, see you in heaven, most of you. Uh, so if you've been watching the news, there's been a lot of stuff going on with, oh, the world must be ending. Um, and, and not just from secular circles, because tomorrow, you may have heard, there's going to be a, an eclipse, a solar eclipse. And um, so um, we've been having a series on the beginning of the earth and the world, and that, of course, is in the book of Genesis. And uh, now we're going we're gonna to kind of tie in. Well, the end is near. Is that a true statement? Yeah, actually it is. The end is near. We just don't know the definition of near. Um, and uh, so what we'll look at this morning, because look, there, the Lord tells us that there's going to be different, uh, we, we'll look, we don't know the time that he's returning, but we do know the, the season. And so uh, this is why people think the world is ending tomorrow, because we've had earthquakes, we've had an eclipse tomorrow, and then um, cicadas. <laughs> Oh my. Now, as far as the earthquakes go, uh, this is where uh, there's people that maybe they mean well, but they make uh, Christians look like fools. Um, so the earthquakes that happened in New York, which it was amazing how that was national news. Ooh, 4.8. On the West Coast, we're like, come on, really? I wouldn't wake up for a six-point earthquake. That's actually not true. How many of you remember the last one, the Nisqually quake? Yeah, so we all know where we were. Um, and it's like, oh, we're having an earthquake. It always makes me think of, of Fred Sanford at Sanford and Son, you know, talking about, um, you know, it's the big one. And he was ready to see his wife. But what was his wife's name? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you. <laughs> So anyway, um, but people have seriously uh, taken a look at, uh, this is what one uh, individual posted, um, of course, social media, which please, please go for your understanding of God's word on social media because that's completely accurate. Uh, this individual said, I think God sent out a warning call this morning to the land. If you didn't notice, there were two earthquakes that hit today that both were 4.8s. The total eclipse is on 4.8. Right, goosebumps already. The eclipse is 4.8, and 4 plus 8 equals 12, which is the number, number of government and divine order biblically. It's all prophesied in the Bible, signs in the sky, rumors, earthquakes, false prophets, etc. So there's like, there's, a, there's some truth to what she's saying, and then there's some, what we call not truth. God has placed Israel on my heart and head this, oh, heart and head this morning too, and after reading upon it and talking to some friends, we realized that it also is concerning the number 48, because Israel was established as a nation in 1948. Eight. Israel was reestablished in 1948 as a nation. She repeats that, so apparently it's important. Um, Psalm 48 in the Bible is also about Israel. The eclipse is going to happen on 4-8. We believe God is reminding us to stand with Israel because Jesus is coming soon for us and to give Israel a chance to receive him as their Messiah before it's too late. Well, again, there, there is some truth to that. Uh, I truly believe that God is sending out warnings because not everyone is, uh, not everyone is taking his word and his commands earnestly. All I know is God is shaking this world up, literally. And it's freezing, literally. Uh, and then if that wasn't, I think there might have been a, you know, a couple of steps too far in her conclusions here. But then she starts quoting different passages from scripture, chapter four, verse eight. James 4, 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your, your, your hearts, you double, your hearts, you double-minded. Exodus 4, 8, 
Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. So that's her proof text. Just for fun, I didn't do this earlier. Pick a book in the Bible. Job. Let's see if Job 4.8 is prophetic here. If it is, we're, we're, we're all going to be in trouble. Sign me up. I will start following her on Facebook for sure. Job 4.8. As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Ooh. Another one? Proverbs 4.8. Proverbs 4.8. Oh, sure, pick Proverbs. We're not going to find anything bad in there. Well, Proverbs 4.8 says, Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. That sounds like dating advice, and <laughs> I'm definitely following that. It, well, Revelation 4.8. Oh, now you guys are... You guys are taking chances. <laughs> Revelation 4, 8. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So we could do this with all of the books, except for the books that don't have four chapters. What do you do with those? And I'm not mocking this individual. I think she's sincere, and I think, oh, yes, Reagan? Can we add this to game night? Sure. <laughs> it makes it biblical. Uh, why not? So, you know, I think, I, again, I'm not mocking her. It, I, I think she's sincere. She's just maybe, like a lot of folks, taking things a little too far in a wrong direction. There, yeah, a little bit of confusion. I think we have a tendency is, you know, we, we all kind of want to maybe feel like we have this special information maybe that other people don't have or I don't know. And so you post stuff online and, and uh, where it goes, who knows, but well, the Lord does. Um, so could the Lord come back tomorrow? Of course he could. Um, now we had this discussion on Wednesday in our Bible study and I have this theory, and some of you hold to it as well, that the Lord will come back on the day that no one has predicted. So stop predicting. Because we want him to come back, right? So stop throwing out dates. He's coming back today. Whoop, blew that one. You know, so God is God. He is sovereign. He is all-knowing. He is almighty. He will choose the day when he is going to have his son return. And our job is to be ready. There you go. End of sermon. Oh, wait. Well, we still have this and that. How many of you, uh, if, you were, if you're from the South, Midwest, you're familiar with cicadas? They are ugly creatures to me. Maybe you find them beautiful. Super noisy is the understatement. If you've never heard cicadas, I mean, it's ear piercing. So what's significant about this year um, is that you have an occurrence. This has not happened since 1803. So cicadas will be, you know, dormant for years. And so you have um, brood, uh, brood nine, excuse me. They operate on a 13 year cycle. I love God's creation. So every 13 years, they come out and have a party. Um, and mainly mid-south from southern Iowa to the Carolinas. Now, brood 13, which arises every 17 years and nests between central Illinois and southern Wisconsin, this year they are due to appear at the same time. And again, it's Thomas Jefferson was president the last time that this happened, so it doesn't happen very often. Um, and yet people are seeing that as another sign of the coming apocalypse. That's not a sign of the coming apocalypse. Now, are there signs? Yes, there are. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at some of those things. So uh, what does the Bible say about the end of the world? That it will end. 
uh, that's what the Bible says. Uh, so before we continue, and we'll be in uh, Genesis to begin with, and we'll bounce around a little bit, um, but uh, we'll have a word of prayer, asking the Lord for wisdom and guidance as we study his word, because we don't want to come to our own conclusions that meet our own whims and thoughts and fancies and all the rest. We truly want to know what the Lord has for us today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your creation. We thank you for this planet that we're on and how you designed it perfectly to sustain life. Lord, we do see a lot of craziness around us and we do see signs of end, the end times. We also recognize that those signs have been out there, well, for the last couple of thousand, couple thousand years. And so Lord, our job is to be aware of what's going on, but more importantly, be prepared and to be prepared spiritually. Lord, if, if you are coming soon, at least soon by our definition, then we should have a strong desire and passion to reach the lost with the gospel, with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so that should be our motivation, that should be our focus. So help us to have that, to have a great passion in reaching the lost, reaching those who are hurting, those who are struggling in life, and offering them the life-saving hope that is available through your Son, Jesus Christ. God, we love you. We thank you for our Lord and Savior, and it's in his name we ask these things. Amen. Well, we have been going through Genesis, and uh, we're not quite to Genesis 6, but uh, we see the, one of the better-known stories or narratives out of uh, Genesis, and that is the flood, or Noah's flood, as it's sometimes referred to. And God, verse 12, chapter 6, saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And that all is interesting because uh, that's humanity and all other living creatures, so everything was corrupt. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So we know how that happens. Uh, of course, we have the flood, and uh, other than seven human beings and a relatively small number of animals, um, the entire population of the planet is wiped out. Now some people might think, well that's cruel and that's mean and why would God be so hateful? But it's God's love that motivates his wrath. He disciplines us who know him because he loves us. He punishes those who don't know him because he loves them. He wants them to come to him. That's his desire. And how many of us have, when the times that we've made great growth or had great growth in our Christian walk has been when we've had bad things happen or what we consider bad things. Those, those moments of pressure where we have to make a decision. Do I follow Jesus or do I keep doing what I'm doing? Because what I'm doing is not working. Every time I go this way, I end up in a bad place. Whereas when I follow Jesus, it doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean that it's free from trouble, but man, I know he's with me and I can feel his love. Uh, I have confidence that uh, he is going to guide me. And so, you know, these individuals that, uh, they had an opportunity to get on the ark. The ark was big enough, it could have held, we don't know how many people. Some people, that's one of their criticisms against the ark, it's like, well, it wasn't big enough to, to hold all of humanity. Maybe it was. You know, I, I'm trying to think of the population, is it seven billion or whatever uh, that we have on the planet now? Um, there weren't seven billion uh, on the planet at that time, but whatever the number was, they were evil to the core, and they were given warnings, a lot of warnings, for a, long, a lengthy amount of time, so that shows God's grace and his patience, his long-suffering. In Genesis chapter 9, God makes a promise, a covenant with Noah, the Noahic covenant as we refer to it. I establish, uh, verse 11, my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there, shall there be a flood to 
destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So God makes a verbal covenant with Noah, which is good enough, but then he puts this beautiful representation of his character in the sky and gives him a rainbow. And it's a reminder every time we see the rainbow of God's faithfulness to us because he said he would never destroy the earth with flood again, and he's kept his word, and he will keep his word. Peter gives us an idea, though, of how the earth is going to be destroyed. So the first time it was with water, the next time, and by next, the last time, <laughs> um, it will be destroyed by what? By fire. Second Peter, and this is a really key passage, so um, we'll look at verse 10, but we'll go back to it a little bit later. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So that brings us back to the eclipse, because there are some that use some interesting ideas to show that, okay, tomorrow is Armageddon. Jesus coming back and or, you know, and sometimes the eschatology gets mixed up just a wee tad. Uh, eschatology, that's just a fancy pants word. It's the study of end times. So uh, eschatos means the end, and uh, ology, you know, the study of, or the, the science of, if you will. So eschatology, there's a, you can impress your friends and family with that. How many of you have seen this map? Yeah, it's been blasted all over social media. Um, and this is proof that uh, we're, we're all gonna die. Um, but before you pack your bags and get ready for heaven, um, so this particular map is showing four different eclipses, one in 2017, which that was the big deal, um, and that's the one that is, uh, well, that one doesn't want to work. Let's go there. That's that one right there. So you can see 2017, August 21. Here's the path of total eclipse for tomorrow, and you can see that, oh my goodness, they forms an X. Yay. Now, I don't know a lot about eclipses. I've seen a solar eclipse. It's pretty cool. Lunar eclipses, we see those, you know, from time to time. This phenomenon where they cross um, and there's different eclipse paths, we might think that they're very random. The, the, when two paths cross within, you know, well, any time, every 18 years and 11 days. That's how precise our God is. Every 18 years and 11 days, two eclipse paths do that. So it's not an unusual phenomenon. So it's happening tomorrow. The 2024 path is gonna cross the uh, other one, the from, one from 2017. Now, what you've probably also heard is that the 2017 um, eclipse crossed several cities by the name of Salem. And Salem means peace. And because it means peace, it's the idea that God is ushering in his peace. Okay. And then tomorrow's path is supposedly crossing seven cities by the name of Nineveh. There's a problem with that. It's only crossing over two cities by the name of Nineveh. Um, and now, are there other cities named Nineveh that will see a partial eclipse? Yes, but as far as total, it's only two. Um, in fact, some lists include one in Canada. So if it's a note to America from God, then apparently he's looping in, you know, some of my relatives as well, which is not likely. No, of course it's. Hi, Mom. Oh, bless you. Uh, we have wonderful Canadian relatives. I just, we just don't talk to them anymore. I don't know where they are, do you? Well, they're presumably in Canada. 
So there's the deal with uh, those two eclipses. Um, now, the whole thing with tomorrow and it being Nineveh, and supposedly the X marks the spot is going to be over a town called Rapture. <laughs> And even if these things were true, <laughs> uh, I mean, what are the odds of this massive path of this solar eclipse? What are the odds that it's going to cross over cities of pick a name? You know, uh, now passing over Seattle, that would be a little more unique because there's only one on the planet. We're thankful for that. Um, but uh, you know, it's just a lot of con coincidences and conjecture and and craziness. Uh, we could go through a whole bunch of, do I really want to do this? I'll do a couple of these. The eclipse was pro will produce a 67 mile wide path across the United States. 1967 was the year Israel regained Judea, Samaria, and East Jerusalem. The property lines are often called the pre-67 lines in peace talks. The maximum level of eclipse coverage will be over Washington, D.C. at 2.42 p.m., about 81%. U.N. Resolution 242 calls for Israel to give up land for an Arab state that is Judea, Samaria, and East Jerusalem. Uh, the sun will, it's, here it says the suns, but I think they only, we only have one, right, still? We're not on um, Tatooine or something here. Um, the sun will set in Jerusalem at the time the eclipse's shadow of totality arrives in Oregon on August 21st. I don't know what that means, but... Um, well, they're talking about the 2017. So the paths of the, 2000, or, uh, the August 21st, 2017 and April 8th, 2024, total solar eclipses create a huge X with a phase of totality of 9,000 square miles the size of New Jersey. Israel is often to be said, often said to be the size of New Jersey. I don't, do I need to read more of that? I mean, that's just, you know, Somebody's been following too closely behind a bus and inhaling. <laughs> so, let's see, what are, if, if these aren't the signs of his return, then what are? Well, you know, we saw on day four of the creation that God said, God made, God set, God saw, God saw. So Genesis chapter one, verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be uh, lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. So we see that God put his creation we see in verse um, 14, let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. God created the calendar. And it is based, I mean, everything, seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years, is all based on God's creation. And we try to do weird things. It's interesting how God's creation is, is perfect. Now, it's under the weight of sin, just like we are. It's under the curse, um, but we keep trying to, we keep having to adjust our methods, if you will. So I heard that this year, it's the first time in a while they've had to adjust the, I don't, some of you smarty people will know, that it's, that it's the universal clock, I don't recall the, the term, but, um, but they're going to have to adjust it by a second or tenth of a second or whatever, because it gets, it gets off um, from time to time. God's clock is not off. His clock is always perfect, um, and so we can trust in him. We have to adjust to his time, not the other way around. So let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 3 and see what Peter has to say. Now, we went through 2 Peter in our Wednesday morning Bible study right after we went through 1 Peter. And the one thing about 2 Peter we noted is that it's brief. Certainly compared, 1 Peter's not that long, but 2 Peter is brief. And 
uh, most Bible scholars believe that uh, 1 Peter was written, um, I mean, it's Peter's words, but Silas is writing it for him, um, and whereas 2 Peter is Peter. It's his heart, his words, his passion, his style. And he says multiple times, you can see his, his passion for the lost in this. And so he says in chapter 3, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. So do we see that today? People mocking Christianity, mocking God, making fun of Scripture, questioning Scripture. Yeah, we do see that. When did that start? Yeah, it's been going on forever, so this is not a new thing. So it kind of seems unfair. If God says, look for these signs that I am coming soon, and we see these signs, is it unfair for, uh, well, is it unreasonable for us to assume that he's coming soon? No, it gets back to that definition of what is soon. We know that Peter thought Jesus was coming in his lifetime, and countless men and women have thought the same. Now, I do kind of fall into that, yeah, but... I think, I think he really is coming soon, <laughs> you know? Like, I don't think he's gonna wait that much longer. Well, we can think that, and that may be true, but is there anything preventing God from coming right now? No. Is there anything from preventing him, uh, preventing him from waiting for a year to come, to return? 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. There's nothing. It's in his hands completely under his, his control. So if he's, I'm kind of getting ahead of uh, the rest of the message. Keep me on track here, Elias, thank you. All right, they will say, verse four, where is the promise of his coming? Now, don't we see that too? Because some people are saying, look, he's been coming soon for 2,000 years, so you guys are nuts. How can we believe that he's coming back? And so we do see that. There is a huge number of Christians um, that are denying the rapture, that it's even going to happen. And that we see that increasing. Um, some of the Gallup polls have, in interviewing churchgoers, more the mainline denominations are saying, yeah, we don't know that that's really going to happen. Maybe it's, uh, it was a spiritual rapture. Um, it was a metaphorical thing. It's not literal. You can't take the Bible literally. I'm not saying that. They're saying that. I would say we always take scripture literally unless it's clear that we shouldn't. <laughs> and it is clear. Now, look, there's, there are some small issues that we, we can quibble over. Uh, one quick side note. This is side sermon. I don't charge extra for these. Yeah, Brian, I just got the double thumbs up from Brian Erickson. That makes me warm inside. Um, think of John. John, here's John. He's in exile, and he's receiving this vision, the revelation, right? But John is seeing future events. How is he going to describe these things? He's going to use terms he's familiar with. If he's seeing modern warfare, for example, we've used this example before. If he's seeing an Apache helicopter, how's John from 2,000 years ago going to, he's like, I don't know what that is. But it kind of looks like this thing with a scorpion tail and, and locust wings and the face of a horse. I mean, he's going to describe it in the terms that he's familiar with and that his audience is familiar with. So when it says things, could, when those things do happen, could it mean something like an Apache helicopter? Yeah, it could. Could it also be literal? That would be figurative, right? Could it be literal and that we're going to see flying lions with horse heads and scorpion tails and locust wings? Yeah, God can do whatever he wants. So I kind of hope it's literal. <laughs> and, I'm hope and I'm banking on not being here to see it. Um, it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll get some, some good seats and you know, some popcorn and I'll just enjoy the view. But... Um, 
So they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, or died, in other words, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. It's like, yeah, nothing's changed. We don't see anything different. So how can we, how can we uh, say for certain that God is, that the Lord is coming back? For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slow, slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. I mean, the fact that the Lord has not come back shows us his great love, his great passion for humanity. Why does he allow the craziness to continue? Because he's giving people another chance. He wants folks to come to him. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, does that include us? Yeah, we're waiting for this to happen. Here's what we're supposed to do. Be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. That's pretty simple. Now, is God, uh, he says that we're supposed to be found without spot or blemish. Um, are we without spot or blemish? No, but hopefully everyone here this morning has put their faith and trust in the Lamb of God who is without spot, who is without blemish. And so when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin, he sees our Savior. He sees the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Because otherwise God couldn't stand the sight of us because our sin is abhorrent to him. But our sins have been paid for, all of them. The little ones, or at least the ones that we think are little, the big ones, doesn't matter. The ones that we have committed, that we will commit, that we're committing right now, shame on you. Um, but be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish. That word diligent, doesn't that give us the idea of, I mean, there's some action there. It doesn't mean sit on our rear ends and just wait for Jesus to come back. It, there's an action to it. Do your due diligence. Study his word. Know his word. Apply his word. Share his word. Verse 15, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks to in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, Take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. The craziness that we see in the world today, we can get upset with the unbeliever, the non-Christian, the heathen, whatever you want to call them, um, and yet whose, whose problem is it, really? Whose fault is it? It's ours because we didn't stand up. Think of the mess that we're in in politics, the mess that we're in in leadership, the mess that we're in morally. Look, unbelievers are serving Satan. Seems mean to say, we're called to serve God. And if you're a servant of Satan, then why would we be surprised if they do what Satan wants them to do? Unbelievers are gonna do unbeliever kind of things. 
The problem is we have Christians doing unbeliever things and thinking, ah, eh, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, I'm forgiven. Yeah, you're forgiven, but don't be stupid at the same time. So take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But, so here's the contrast. And I think, I think Peter, it's kind of his nod to Paul, because Paul always d does this compare and contrast sort of thing and says, okay, here's the bad stuff, now do this. Like think of the fruit of the Spirit, right? In Galatians 5, and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit. Before that, we have the works of the flesh. So there's that contrast. And Peter does something similar here. So don't be carried away with the error of lawless people, but rather grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. It's a great passage. And even though we studied 2 Peter not that long ago, if you're kind of struggling with what's going on in the world, just read 2 Peter. And it's a, it's a good reminder. There's a good uh, exhortation there. So, Peter says, look, I don't know when the Lord's coming back, but it is going to happen, and your job is to be ready. Paul addresses this a few times. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul's just right out with it because there were some goofy things uh, uh, being taught um, and he wanted to clear some of those things up in the church of Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. It's like, yeah, I don't need to tell you this stuff. You just, just open your eyes. You can see what's going on. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, Peter used that same language, didn't he? Like a thief. Um, I've not been a thief for long. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, working in jails and prisons for many years, the guys that I met with, I never met one that said, yeah, you know, when I was going to rob a house or steal stuff, I would text the homeowners first and just let them know. <laughs> they don't do that? Alex said he does. <laughs> you know, I, the world don't move to the beat of just one drum. from the great philosopher Alan Thicke, who wrote that theme song, yeah, anyway. So, um, thieves don't announce that they're going to do something. Well, actually, you know what? They kind of do now, they don't care, because they don't respect, that. they don't believe there's gonna be a consequence, so we see this lawlessness uh, going on. But uh, typically, if you're gonna commit a crime, you don't let the victim know ahead of time. Hey. Um, April 13th at 2 p.m. I'm gonna murder you. Is that time good for you? <laughs> Alex says yes, all right. I mean, we just, we don't do that. So of course, what's the point? Is that the Lord's not gonna send us a text. He's not gonna send us an email. Now it says we, sh we can know the seasons. So that's a little more difficult in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> to know what season it is. It's like, are we in the rainy season? Well, <laughs> pick a day. Yes, you are in the rainy season. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So I have not been pregnant nor can I get pregnant. Um, regardless of what I call myself. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. So ladies who've been pregnant or are pregnant, uh, you can let me know. But you know if you're pregnant, labor pains will happen. You kind of have an idea when they'll happen, but you don't know exactly, you don't specifically know. There's not like, okay, they're gonna start in three, two, one. There, did I show my amazing uh, grasp of 
female biology and I got a thumbs up from Nicole. Alrighty. The rest of you are just shaking your head. As you should. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So what are we supposed to do? Uh, Paul tells Timothy, a young Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2.15, I think you know this verse. Uh, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. Uh, that's actually from the New American Standard. Uh, ESV, I thought the wording was a little wonky, but. So, um, we have some further information though from our good buddy Paul, and that's, I think, a great application for us this morning. On his second missionary journey, you can kind of see where that is. And, uh, you can see, you know, there's Ephesus right there. We know that pretty well. Uh, Corinth right there. There's Athens, of course, Greek. There's Thessalonica. But it's right near Thessalonica, that little city there called Berea. And Berea, there it is. Um, is mentioned uh, just a couple of times in Scripture as a group, and then once there's a specific Berean uh, that is mentioned. So, Acts chapter 17. They're on this second missionary journey, and here's what we see in the book of Acts. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. And that was kind of typical. They'd go to a new town, they would go to the synagogue. Um, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. So there's step one. They were happy to hear the word. They wanted to hear it. They wanted to learn. But notice the second part, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So somebody could come along and say X, Y, and Z, but the Bereans were diligent in that they wanted to check it out. It's like, does this line up with what? we know to be true? Does this line up with Scripture? And it says in verse 12, many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. So you can see there's different motivations. The one group, they wanted to know God's word. They wanted to be accurate in their understanding. And then you had this other group of religious leaders that they weren't happy with that. Because if people know the truth, then they may not buy your lie. In fact, they probably won't. And it gets down to power and control and money and all sorts of crazy things. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul uh, brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So that would be one of our, I think, important applications today, is be like a Berean. Uh, the Bereans wanted to know God's word, and they studied God's word so that they would accurately apply it, accurately share it. So when, we, when people say things about the end of the world happening tomorrow and, and these weird connections with numbers and things like that with the eclipse and with cicadas and uh, with Taylor Swift, I'm sure she's in there somewhere. Um, then, <laughs> I wonder where she's gonna be tomorrow. Anyway, but we should be excited uh, we're not going to see the eclipse out here. I mean, 
certainly not a total eclipse. Um, but uh, remember to wear your glasses. But uh, if you want to fly, um, I heard on the news that that swath, that path, um, Airbnb, hotels, everything's booked uh, along that stretch because so many people want to see uh, the total eclipse. If you've never seen one, I mean, it is cool. Um, and it's only, remember, it's only when it's a total eclipse that you can stare at it without any, you know, protection. But um, this is from Answers in Genesis, kind of their reminder on the eclipse. Because this is cool, it is cool stuff. But a reminder to us about our God. First of all, the mathematical precision of the heavens point to a creator. I mean, isn't it? It's phenomenal. If this world just evolved and everything in it, then you would not expect this precision. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Even remember that crisscross phenomenon, 18 years, 11 days. That's pretty precise. And because God has given us the ability to discover these things, guess what? We know when the eclipse is going to happen. We know the time it's going to start, when it's going to end, the duration. We know all of that stuff. And this is not new. This is stuff that astronomers have known for centuries because they studied God's creation. Think about the, the Magi who studied the Star of Bethlehem. They knew astronomy. They knew the Word because they had studied the book of Daniel. They knew what Daniel had to say about these things. Um, and so it's not technology that makes us wise. It's studying God's creation and applying it. Number two, the heavens really do declare the glory of God. Think of Peter's description of the end when God destroys the heavens and the earth with fire and it talks about a roar. I mean, it's going to be spectacular. And thirdly, it's obvious to all that there's a creator. I honestly believe every person on this planet believes there is a creator, even if they deny it with their mouth. I think deep down everybody knows. Um, but when you deny that there is a God, when you deny that he is a creator, when you deny that he's the sovereign God of the universe, then you have to accept all sorts of ridiculous stuff. So people have been predicting the end of the world forever. Okay, that would be not, not a literal statement, right? So what do all of these individuals have in common? Yeah, they've all predicted the rapture, the end of the world. Spoiler alert, they've all been wrong. You want me to name them all? Well, there's this dude over here. So I, I have pages and pages of notes of, of people who have predicted the end of the world or the rapture. Um, the guy in the, uh, yeah, this guy right there, um, that is uh, Hippolytus of Rome. You're like, oh, yeah, I knew that. Um, now, with a couple of other guys, uh, Sextus Julius, uh, excuse me, Sextus Julius Africanus and Irenaeus, they all three predicted that Jesus would return in five, the year 500. Uh, and we could back up, by the way, so even in uh, AD 66 through 70, Simon bar -Giora and the Essenes, remember the Essenes, those are the dudes that we think were responsible for compiling the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and they were really into eschatology and the Lord's return. The, the Essenes, they they uh, saw that the Jewish uprising against Rome in 66 to 70 in Judea was the final end time battle which would bring about the arrival of Messiah. Um, in fact, there were coins that were minted proclaiming the redemption of Israel. Uh, that's how firmly they believed in that. So back to uh, uh, Hippolytus. He uh, predicted, uh, along with these other guys, uh, the year that Jesus would return, so 500, um, with one of the predictions being based on the dimensions of Noah's Ark. Another prediction was based on the dimensions of the tabernacle uh, built, of course, by the Israelites with Moses. 
Uh, this dude here, that is Pope Sylvester II. He's the first pope to have a cat. According to several sources, various Christian clerics predicted the year 1000. You can understand why people thought, oh, the year 1000, that's got to be it. People wouldn't do something like that again, 2000. Um, <laughs> so see, we need to be really careful. We chuckle at these stupid predictions, but be careful we aren't on the same cruise, you know? Can I just say flatly, don't predict a specific date. Now you can say, I think maybe because of this, I think that's okay, we can speculate, we can, you know, but don't, don't hang your hat on a specific date. Be very careful. There's a difference between I know and I think. Um, so he predicted, yes, the millennium would start. Riots actually broke out in many uh, parts of Europe, and pilgrims headed east to Jerusalem. Um, other historians have disputed these things, but uh, let's see, who else do we have on here? Thomas Munzer, that's uh, that guy right there, looks super happy, probably because he thought the world was ending, but... Um, he said that the, uh, the beginning of the millennium would happen in 1525. Uh, he was an Anabaptist, uh, not an Anabaptist, which is a very different thing. Um, his followers were killed by cannon fire in a battle with government troops, and he died under torture and was beheaded. So what's the moral of the story? If you predict the end or the rapture, you might lose your head. 1533, Melchor Hoffman, there you go, of the Boston Hoffmans, uh, he was also an Anabaptist. He predicted Christ's second coming to take place in Strasbourg. He claimed that 144,000 people would be saved. Oh, where did he get that number from? Uh, while the rest of the world would be consumed by fire. Um, I think my notes got... Uh, that guy, you know him, yeah? Martin Luther, 1600. Um, he actually um, predicted the end of the world would occur no later than 1600. You know this guy here? Columbus, Christopher, good name, Christ bearer. Columbus claimed that the world was created in 5,000 well, 53, 43 BC, and would last 7,000 years. So you can see some of them, are, their numbers are not unreasonable. You can understand where they get 7,000 and 6,000 and these different things. Um, and so he felt that that meant the world would end in 1658. It didn't. Uh, oh, look at that awesome hair. That's Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather, he revised, uh, he had a couple predictions um, it would, that the world was going to end in 1697, and then when that failed to happen, he said, oops, I did my math wrong, it's 1716. When that didn't happen, he threw out 1736. Um, if ladies, you're feeling underrepresented, Mary Bateman, um, she was known as the Witch of Leeds from Leeds, England. In 1806, uh, she claimed that her hen began <laughs> laying eggs on which the phrase Christ is coming was written. Hold on to your seats. Eventually, it was found to be a hoax that she was etching Christ is coming on the eggs and at Sunday morning, putting them back in the chicken. Yeah. Now we know why the chicken crossed the road, <laughs> to get away from this crazy, crazy woman. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm sorry, that's her up, there's Mary up there. Uh, this is, I, I just besmirched the reputation of Joanna Succoth. Um, she was 64 years old, described herself as a prophet, and said that she was pregnant with the Christ child. And that, <laughs> And you know, the chicken was bad, right? 
that he, Jesus would be born on October 19, 1614. She died later that year not having delivered a child and an autopsy proved that she had never been pregnant. Uh, John Wesley, I mean, one of the founders of the Methodist movement. Um, let's see, where's John? There he is. Why none of these people smile is beyond me, but... Uh, John Wesley, he felt that the millennium would begin in 1836, and he wrote that Revelation 12:14 referred to uh, the year 1058 and 1836 when Christ, when Christ should come. Um, now the Millerites, did I put a picture of the Millerites up there? No, I didn't. Uh, the Millerites, they had all sorts of uh, predictions. Um, they thought that uh, Christ would return on March 21st, 1844. When he didn't, they changed that to October 22nd, 1844, um, saying, oh, we miscalculated scripture. Um, I mean, people, this was a, a huge thing, and I mean, people sold all of their goods, and, and um, so it was termed the Great Disappointment, which coincidentally is what my mom called my birth. No, that's not true. <laughs> She's like, eh. Charles Taz, Taz Russell, anyone know him? Yeah, so he found it was called the Bible Student Movement, which is still around, uh, but it's had a few different uh, iterations. Uh, here, we'll take a little, little detour with, with good old Charles Taz. So currently, the, the logo on the left is the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania, which is actually the, the corporate umbrella for uh, all of the Watchtower and the Jehovah's Witnesses, of course. Um, Russell, some of his followers were called Russellites, but he said uh, 1914 that that was going to be the battle of the great day of God Almighty. and. Um, and said that scripture definitely marked October of 1914. Um, that was when it was going to happen. Well, obviously, again, it, it didn't. And uh, the Watchtower Society has notoriously, at least in their history, picked a lot of dates. Oh, I did forget, if you know who Botticelli is, the artist, um, it, he actually painted his prediction in this painting, which is uh, that the devil was loose and would soon be chained. Um, I think it's called Mystic Nativity or something like that. Mysterious Nativity. Um, it's, it's creepy nativity in my book, but whatever. So we've got a lot of folks, and I don't want to spend an inordinate amount of time on them, but some of the notables that are up there. Um, Margaret Rowan, she's in the lower left uh, corner there. She was a seventh Day Adventist. Uh, SDA has historically uh, been very interested in prophecy, and she said that the angel Gabriel appeared before her in a vision uh, and told her that the world would end at midnight on February 13th, 1925. Coincidentally, that was the morning after Taco Tuesday. No connection there. Um, Herbert W. Armstrong, he's the guy in the color photo just to the above uh, Jean Dixon, remember her? That's her right there. So there's, there's good old Herbert W. Armstrong. He was the founder of the Worldwide Church of God. Now, they're still around, but his son took over several years ago and said, yeah, dad was nuts. And they line up much more closely with, with uh, evangelicals. Um, but yeah, he predicted um, 1936 and that only people who belong to his church would be saved. Um, after that didn't happen, he revised the date three additional times because, you know, when you're prophesying heresy, third time's a charm. Gene Dixon uh, and various Indian astrologers predicted that there would be a planetary alignment on February 4th, 1962 that would bring about the destruction of the world. There were mass prayer meetings held in India. Um, now, Chuck Smith, good dude, you can see him right there, founder of Calvary Chapel. Um, he predicted that the general
generation of 1948 would be the last generation and that the world would end by 1981 at the latest. Now, I will give Smith credit. He did say, I could be wrong. And that's important, an important distinction. So, um, and uh, so I'll, I'll, give him, I'll give him that credit. Um, Pat Robertson, there he is right up there. He predicted in, uh, that in late 1976, on the 700 Club, predicted that the end of the world would come in 1982. There were a bunch of, I mean, I, I, as we get farther along in history, it seems like there's more and more folks coming up with dates. Hal Lindsey, you can see him right there. He felt that 1988, um, and again, that was based on, okay, Israel, 1948, 40 years a generation after, so 1988. So you can kind of see where they come up with this stuff. Um, I think the last one uh, I'll mention, because again, we could talk about all of these guys forever. I mean, Jerry Falwell predicted, a, a ton of people predicted January 1st, 2000. Um, Tim LaHaye, Jerry Jenkins, um, remember the whole Y2K thing, you know, which it happened, <laughs> but not to the extent that everybody, you know, that the results were not the same. So the last one that I'll talk about is in the lower right hand corner, he gets his own slide, and that's Harold Camping. Um, Harold Camping had made several predictions um, over the years. Um, he started making predictions Let's see, it's hard because he's, he's all over the place here, but he felt that September 6th, 1994, that didn't happen, so he changed it to September 29th, 1994, that didn't happen, so he changed it to October 2nd, 1994, that didn't happen, so then he revised it to March 31st, 1995. Um, so then he was quiet until 2011 and decided, maybe his math was off again. And so um, he predicted that the rapture and devastating earthquakes would occur on May 21st, 2011, with God taking approximately, th taking approximately 3% of the world's population to heaven, and that the end of the world would occur five months later on October 21st. Didn't happen. Um, now, when May 21st, Went, came and went, then he said, oh, 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 my bad. Um, it was a spiritual judgment. It wasn't literal. So it happened, but October 21st, definitely, definitely. Do you remember this one? I mean, uh, you can see, I mean, they paid for billboards, familyradio.com. Um, it, was, it was a big deal. So when that didn't happen, uh, well, that sort of, um, their giving took sort of a hit. Um, now, Harold Camping, I think just days after that, the October 21st didn't happen, had a pretty severe stroke. Um, and the reason I want to mention Harold Camping is because he's one of the few that I think got it, finally got it right. So this is a statement that he issued, um, I think a few weeks after October 21st didn't happen. Um, he said, in this time of confusion and turmoil, God's word remains the only truth in which we can trust. God has shown us again that the truth, shown us again the truth that he alone is true. In Romans 3, 4, God declares, let God be true, but every man a liar. Events within the last year have proven that no man can be fully trusted. Even the most sincere and zealous of us can be mistaken. The May 21st campaign was an astounding event if you think of, about its impact on the world. There is no question that millions if not billions of people heard for the first time the Bible's warning that Jesus will return. Huge portions of this world that had never read or seen a Bible heard the message that, of, uh, that Jesus Christ is coming to rapture his people and destroy this natural world. Yes, we humbly acknowledge we were wrong about the timing. Yet, though we were wrong, God is still using the May 21st warning in a very mighty way. And he talks about how it did bring attention, at least, to, to God's word. 
but he says we must also openly acknowledge that we have no evidence pointing to another date for the end of the world and though m many dates are circulating family radio has no interest in even considering another date God has humbled us through the events of May 24th, 21st to continue to even more fervently search the scriptures the Bible not to find dates but to be more faithful in our understanding we have learned the very painful lesson that all of creation is in God's hands and he will end time in his time not ours we humbly recognize that God may not tell his people the date when Christ will return any more than he tells anyone the date they will die physically and he closes by saying so we must be satisfied to humbly wait upon God and trust he will guide his people to safety at family radio we will continue to look to God for guidance if it is his, if it, 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 it is his good pleasure for us to continue on with our original mission the proclamation of the gospel God's word then we must continue to look to him may God bless you Harold camping so I got to give the guy a lot of credit um, that he acknowledged the error and acknowledged what we all should acknowledge that God is in control of time we can speculate we can guess we can have opinions that's fine but we need to be very careful when we start prophesying because remember the biblical requirement for a prophet was 100% accuracy and death was the result that was the penalty so in closing that's the Baptist five-minute snooze bar Ephesians, Paul reminds the church in Ephesus, look carefully then how you walk, not as wise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish but understand what the will of the Lord is. So some questions to consider uh, as our, our response. What role does creation play in sharing the gospel? The eclipse, can, how can you use the eclipse to share Jesus with people? How can you use the talk about earthquakes and cicadas and all the rest? What can we learn from the Bereans? What about their example? How can we apply the, uh, what they did uh, to our lives? And how should living in the end times influence our daily lives? We are in the end times. We just don't know when the end is. But we're to live as if Jesus could come at any moment because he can. He will come at the perfect time and our, you know, the, the world will never be the same and yet even the rapture will be an opportunity for those who don't know Christ to come to Christ. So what is our role in that, in proclaiming the good news of the gospel? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the many men and women who study your word diligently and, and God may we do the same and at the same time be uh, aware of our our failing as human beings and our imperfections help us to stick with what we know to be true help us to spend our time on that and not on some of these uh, side um, topics and, and some of these secondary issues God, all of your word is important. And we know that prophecy is important because there's a chunk of your word that is dedicated to what will be. Our job is to study who you are, who you are today, yesterday, yesterday, today, and forever, and recognize that Jesus Christ is on the throne. You are on the throne, and you are in charge. We love you, Lord. We praise you and ask these things in your son's name. Amen.